All right, welcome back, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, this is our first lesson of Social 10. And when you leave here today, you should be able to understand what is globalization. So we want you to be able to define globalization. When we leave you here today, we want you to understand that there's various uh, dimensions or nuances of globalization. And because there's so many dimensions or, or nuances of it, it, uh, it adds to the complexity, right? So to some extent, globalization can be seen as a benevolent force, a force of good, a helpful force. And for others, it may be seen as a malevolent, a force of evil, something that hurts them. So we're going to begin today by in our notes putting down, you know, what is globalization? And put most simply, it is the interconnectedness of people. Globalization is the interconnectedness of people. So when we say the interconnectedness of people, critically and analytically, you might be saying, okay, wait a minute, how do we connect? You're telling us that we connect, but how do we connect? So today we're going to look at many dimensions of globalization, many facets, nuances, ways we connect. We connect economically. So in your notes, we're going to want to leave here today with an example of economic globalization, an example of connecting economically. But we also connect religiously. We connect culturally, politically, socially, and even morally. So by the time you leave here today, you'll have an example of each one of those connections. And I would argue that we are so interconnected that globalization is more than just the interconnectedness of mankind. It's actually the hyper-connectedness of mankind. We are so connected, we're hyper-connected. There's not just one line that connects you and me. There's multiple lines. People are connected economically and religiously and culturally and politically and socially and morally. We're connected in so many ways, we're hyper-connected. We're connected in this hyper-connected way to the extent that the global community has shrunk and now we can describe ourselves as living in a global village. That we are so hyper-connected that we live in a global village. That if you lived in a village, you're very close to your neighbors. That your fates are intertwined. Your lives are connected. We are now living in an age of a global village because we are so connected with each other. So I am, in a moment, going to talk about economic connections. And then I'll stop this, which is part one of today's lesson. And then you guys will have a chance to collaborate and talk about moral, social, religious, cultural, and political connections. And then we'll get back together and we'll have a discussion about those connections. So I'm going to begin with economic connections connections. Now, I would make the argument that I, I probably picked the easiest one. Economic globalization. We connect with each other. Why do we connect? How do we connect? We connect because we trade. We trade things. So maybe back in elementary school, you're sitting in a lunchroom and Someone else had cookies and you had potato chips and you wanted their cookies, they wanted your potato chips and you made a trade. Everybody's happy. That's what trading is, right? It's an exchange of goods or services. Well, economic globalization is simple as, you know, what did you have for breakfast? So I need to walk away from the camera for a second and go get a prop because I'm thirsty and also because it's going to help Describe this. So I have a protein shake. And the protein shake is chocolate. It's banana. It's peanut butter. It's not really native to Wetaskiwa. It's not really native to Canada. I have a neighbor that has a greenhouse in Millet. He's an amazing guy. He grows things. He grows tomatoes. 
He doesn't grow bananas. We could grow bananas in his greenhouse, but they'd be quite expensive to grow. There are places in the world that grow bananas. We get bananas from Nicaragua, Honduras, El Salvador, Costa Rica. I like saying those names because it makes me pretend like I've been there with a bit of an accent. They have what I would call a comparative advantage. So that's a term that I'm going to bring up on the board, comparative advantage. And it's a big part of globalization, and it's a big part of the economic facet of it. So when I talk about comparative advantage, I think about football teams. Anybody in here play football this year? That's awesome. So on a football team, let's say somebody's six foot seven, three hundred and ten pounds, probably gonna be put on the offensive line. They have a comparative advantage of making that wall to defend the quarterback. If you're five foot and eighty five pounds, maybe the O line's not the best position for you. If you get blown up on, on every play. You know, their defense can just rush past you. You don't have a comparative advantage for that position. Now, the six foot seven, 315-pound lineman may not be your best running back or your best wide receiver because they don't have the best sprinting time. You know, like, man, I'd love to get downfield for that pass, but I'm carrying 315 pounds with me as I run. I can't get past their defensive backs. So on a football team, we have some people that are O-linemen, we have kickers, we have receivers, we have quarterbacks, and, and there's identification camps, right, ID camps, and coaches are looking for certain attributes that athletes have different comparative advantages. Connor McDavid's a very fast skater. Why would you put him in net where he doesn't get to skate? So back to economics, comparative advantage, some countries have a climate where they have geography like soil or topography or like hills that make it easy for them to or easier for them to grow bananas we don't have that we could grow bananas but it would be more costly for us to do it so when we go to the global village as albertans we don't bring alberta bananas we bring what do we have an advantage in oil natural gas and there's other things too. Canola, right? We have a good growing climate for barley, wheat, canola. We may not have the best, but we have some of the best soil in the world too. Gives us a, a comparative advantage. Where's a country that probably doesn't grow great crops? They don't have as much arable land. They don't have as much water. Where would be an example of a country like that? country that needs our wheat, needs our barley, needs our canola. Greenland, because they don't have the climate, they don't have the, the topography, they don't have the arable land. So they buy our crops and they give us something that they have a comparative advantage in, something that we don't have. So if we want to eat uh, Arctic char, there's no Arctic char native to Alberta because we actually are a landlocked province. We have, we have no you know, marine life here that, uh, like Arctic char that uh, would be delicious to eat. So we have to import that, right? So the whole idea of economic globalization, when you connect, why would people connect? One of the stories of this year, historically, people have connected time and time and time again to trade. Somebody's got something, something somebody else doesn't have. The Chinese have silk. So we're like, oh man, we don't know how to make silk. The Chinese aren't going to tell us that. Because, you know, it's making them rich knowing how to make it, and we don't. So the Romans buy silk from the Chinese, and they, they send back things that uh, Europe has, like silver and gold, that the Chinese want. So why do people interact? One of the main reasons is to trade. And that's why I have this delicious chocolate, peanut butter, banana, protein shake. Globalization. And it really is good. Like, it's it's ridiculously good. I don't know why it turned out so good today. They're going to want us to go down and get textbooks, and I'm not even close to being ready. 
So this might be the end of the first half of the first video.